our panel on addressing environmental health equity. Uh, this panel is uh, part of the larger UVA MLK community celebration. And this year's theme um, is celebrating the dream, continuing the journey. And so I hope that in this panel, we really see that uh, ethos of continuing the journey and in, in some of the expertise that our panels will panelists will bring us. Um, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Christy Julian. I use she, her, hers pronouns. And I am one of the co-chairs of UVA's Civic Engagement Subcommittee, along with Erica Hurst. Um, and so this panel is, is possible um, because of a partnership with the Civic Engagement Subcommittee, the Medical Center, um, and there's Medical Center Hour Programming, and Virginia Clinicians for Climate Actions. Um, and so it's a lot of different interdisciplinary, uh, co-disciplinary units coming together um, to talk about what we think is a very important um, uh, topic. Uh, as far as the Civic Engagement Subcommittee, our purpose, our whole reason of being is to try and build those kind of disparate connections um, across grounds and across the community. And so we really strive to do that by being intentional about creating opportunities for dialogue um, and opportunities for dialogue that can move folks into action when we think about that overlap between sustainability, equity, and social justice, which hopefully you folks on Zoom and you folks in the room have an interest in one or more um, of those things. Um, so I hope that this is a panel that sparks uh, new ideas and connections, clarifies concepts, uh, catalyzes us into action, um, and just allows us to uh, enjoy each other um, and really connect with a community of care. Um, and so before uh, introducing the uh, panelists, I'd like to formally acknowledge Virginia Coalitions for Climate Action, a uh, truly amazing group, and could not have uh, put this together um, without them, and the generosity of the UVA Medical Center Hour, which is a program uh, of the Center for Health and Humanities and Ethics. So I think you're going to hear a lot of cross-disciplinary stuff happening today, which is really cool. Um, so I want to take the time to uh, turn it over to our panelists and do a quick introduction of all the folks who are going to be leading us through the discussion today. Lena Bichelle is a fourth year medical student at the UVA School of Medicine, where she founded the UVA chapter of Medical Students for a Sustainable Future. Dr. Tracy Kelly is a director of the Pediatric Acute Care NP program at the UVA School of Nursing. Dr. Irene Mathieu is a writer and assistant professor of pediatrics at the University of Virginia, and Dr. Ebony Hilton is an anesthesiologist and critical care physician at University of Virginia. Um, lastly, before I close, I'd like to thank my co-conspirators, um, Erica Hers and Dana Schroeder, um, who uh, just really have worked so hard to create this really excellent event for you all. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our amazing panelists. Thank you all. Welcome to those here in the room and coming in remotely. Thank you for attending. My name is Tracy Kelly and I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner. I'm also on faculty at the School of Nursing. People come into climate justice space through different routes and my route was through working in the global health setting. For at least two decades, I have intermittently lived and worked in several low-income countries in Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Countries such as Cambodia, Indonesia, Sierra Leone are at the forefront of environmental injustices. They are vulnerable for many reasons. The two that I come up with is very little money is available to spend on healthcare needs in these countries and very little attention is paid to the adversity of the population. I witnessed the impact of weather on these communities and the health of individuals. Droughts, monsoons, and extreme heat could devastate crops, and as a consequence, children died of malnutrition. In fact, the three leading causes of death in the children under five worldwide is diarrhea, pneumonia, and malaria, all impacted by weather, water, and parasites. I watched as communities tried to mitigate the impact of these weather changes, carrying Jerry water in jerry, um, jerry cans, composting, and structuring their homes and roads in a way that could survive shifts in water delivery or powerful storms. 
Each time I returned to the United States, I was struck by our waste, our disregard of the environment, and our assumption that clean drinking water would flow from our taps. I tried to honor the people who so graciously welcomed me into their country by attempting to live a leave no trace lifestyle, reducing my use of unnecessary toxins, limiting my intake of red meat. I used the public transportation system whenever I could. I dusted off my bicycle, but I wasn't an advocate. I wasn't an activist. I stood on environmental justice from afar. A few years ago, Jane Fonda, the actress and activist, began Fire Drill Fridays to address aspects of climate change and environmental injustices. She and famous people marched on Capitol Hill, people made speeches, sit-in happens in uh, congressional buildings, arrests were made. I was interested, but I watched again from afar. I taught on Fridays, so I really couldn't participate. One day I received an email from the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environment, Annie. It's a nursing group that I was uh, very interested in and it was involved in health impacts of climate change. Jane Fonda had invited nurses all over the country to join for her Friday, Fire Joe Friday, and Annie wanted me and other nurses to come. The event was scheduled for December 20th, 2019. School was out of session. I had a lot of friends in DC. I knew I could spend um, the night with somebody. The train leaves Charlottesville and goes straight into Capitol Hill. I was pretty much out of excuses. So I went to the Raleigh. I met Jane Fonda, Gloria Steinem was there, Reverend William Barber, a pastor and social activist who led Moral Mondays in North Carolina when I lived there, spoke. My environmental justice activism started at the Raleigh and continues today. Ani, the group that invited me to the Raleigh has a challenge, Nurses Climate Challenge, for all academic schools of nursing to empower and educate health professionals on environmental justice. UVA School of Nursing joined the challenge and to date over 423 nursing students have been educated on environmental justice. I just wanna take a moment to thank people in this room and remotely who have helped add nursing students to that list. Thank you. Hello all, welcome. Uh, my name is Lena Bichelle and I'm the fourth year medical student uh, here at UVA. So I came to environmental justice as an undergraduate studying environmental biology and animal behavior at Georgetown University. Studying the impacts of climate change on the animal world segued pretty naturally into exploring the same dynamics in humans. Once I started reading and learning, there was no choice but to come involved, become involved in advocacy and environmental justice. As a first year medical student and Hook Scholar in the Center for Health Humanities and Ethics, I joined Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action. In doing so, I met mentors from across the state advocating for equity and planetary minded policy. Since then, I started the UVA School of Medicine's Student Clinicians for Climate Action, uh, mentioned in the intro. Um, we expanded that group to include members of the School of Nursing and other health professional trainees as well. We've since developed medical curricula around climate change and human health, participated in advocacy days with our state legislators, and gotten connected with similarly motivated health students from across the state. As an aspiring pediatrician, I plan to continue this work through residency and my career, and I'm excited to be a part of today's Medical Center Hour. Thank you. Let's see here. So, um, Ebony Hilton, um, you know, I am an anesthesiologist here at the University of Virginia, but I oftentimes say that the degrees did not lead me to where I am as far as advocacy and, and, um, and being an activist. I think you can be an advocate and an activist based on your concern about environmental issues, and then you have those that are activists and advocates because of circumstances by which they were born, and I am one of those latter. I grew up in a, um, you know, single parent home. And I became an activist because of what I noticed around my community. There were no sidewalks. There was billows of smoke um, that could be seen from, you know, miles away. You saw that and heard on the news how your water was contaminated and yet it was still allowed to go and, and 
flow through your faucet. Those are the things that made me an activist because if not, I wouldn't survive, right? And so um, when, when thinking about this, that's the way I, I like to approach it because now I can be an activist out of concern because my water is tested and I do have the power of persons around me having wealth to be able to go and protest and say, you will not put this pipeline in my backyard, right? Um, and so that's the way I approach it. And I think of really most things. So, yeah. So for me, uh, my name is Iran Machia. I'm a general pediatrician here at UVA. And for me, the work kind of grew out of two different sources. First of all, I would say it was my own internal feelings of grief and anxiety and distress about what's happening in our world. And it sounds kind of funny to say, but I don't think I was really completely aware of those emotions initially, but I am a, I'm a writer and primarily a poet. And those emotions started to come out in my poetry and other people started saying, hey, did you notice that this, this stuff is in these poems? So I think that was the first step of awareness of, of how personally I was feeling about what was going on. But then I think more broadly as somebody who tries to be an, an advocate for my patients, not only in the clinic, but also in our communities, becoming aware of some of the issues that are going on around the world, as um, everyone's alluded to, but especially here in Central Virginia, where I work around climate injustice and environmental injustices, um, really kind of got me onto the activist path uh, as a member of Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action. And for me, that started um, particularly with the Pine Grove Project, which is an effort to save the Pine Grove School and to protect that community from a landfill that is encroaching just south of here. And so I got involved with that and that sort of led me to Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action. And so now as a steering committee member, I, I do work with speaking out and writing about these issues as they affect Virginia, but with an eye toward the fact that we're all part of one larger global ecosystem and that what affects one will ultimately affect us all. So now we're gonna dive into some questions. Um, can you each discuss the intersectionality of environmental justice and climate change? What is involved and perhaps provide some examples of environmental justice in your own work, in addition to what you've just described? Sure, so it's kind of touching on some of the themes that Dr. Hilton already mentioned. I think this is really a bi-directional relationship. We see that a lot of the causes of climate change, which are a big industry that burns fossil fuels, are disproportionately located in low wealth communities and communities of color all across the US, but also around the world, as Dr. Kelly pointed out. And so we have to name that, that connection and call out the fact that environmental racism and environmental injustice are part of the very same processes that are driving the climate change that in some way everyone experiences or touches everyone. But the flip side of that coin is that when climate change happens and when these events happen, such as more powerful storms, droughts, heat island effect, the spread of uh, disease causing vectors, we know that they also disproportionately impact those very same low wealth communities and communities of color. And a great example of this is heat island effect. So for those who aren't aware, heat island effect is this notion that when it gets hot in the summer, um, the urban cores tend to be the areas that are significantly by several degrees are significantly hotter than the surrounding suburban and rural areas. And that's because of urban design or lack thereof. And the fact that these urban cores have more sidewalk, more asphalt, more brick, uh, more energy absorbing materials and fewer tree, uh, cover, less tree canopy um, and fewer types of architecture that could diffuse and absorb that, um, deflect that heat. So even if you were to drive around Charlottesville, you would see that some of the wealthier uh, neighborhoods in the city of Charlottesville have significantly more tree canopy, which helps to deflect that heat and um, keep it off of houses. And the more low wealth areas have less of that. And so why does that matter? Well, we know that heat island effect is really significant because heat illness is a huge driver of illness and death uh, in this country, but also around the world. And aside from illness and death, and, and we know that heat of course affects the very young and the very old disproportionately, we also know that it affects everything from human behavior um, to even crime rates. And so this really has a, a very direct disproportionate impact on low wealth communities. So that's just one example of how climate issues and environmental justice issues are very much intertwined. 
Yeah, and I'll echo that. You know, when we're talking about tree canopies, um, the two lowest, I think, areas in, in our local vicinity of tree canopy is 10th Street and Star Hill. And we know who, who primarily lives there. And you're not only dealing with the, the things of tree canopies and the lack of sidewalls, but we can also think about the intersection of environmental injustice and systemic racism and how that plays into health disparities. And that's where I really um, get a little tickle um, because, you know, oftentimes when you hear racism, we oftentimes just point to the deep south and think, oh, it's just there. But we know the same lead water that's contaminated those in Flint, Michigan is the same lead water that's contaminated those in Jackson, Mississippi. It's the same lead water that's contaminating the children of Hampton um, Road that we can look and see that those kids are more likely to present with lead poisoning um, than white children. And so when we're talking about and approaching environmental racism, we, we can't just stop um, at one level. It really is a multi-factor pooling of policy, the way we've orchestrated in the lining and um, definition of our communities, dating back to redlining of the 1930s. Um, this isn't a new phenomenon, but it is a persistent phenomenon. And it's one of those things that we are starting to coin this phrase of, um, you know, instead of post-traumatic distress, it, it's persistent traumatic distress because these things are still occurring within the communities and little um, is being done to actually prevent it and not only prevent it, but also kind of reparations as to what is the generational impact that this has had on those persons of that community. Um, I describe my own step into environmental justice as having some hesitancy and uncertainty. Can you help uh, those in the room and those on Zoom who might share some of that doubt uh, about getting involved to identify steps they can take to be involved? Um, what, where can people go to get some more information? I think that some of the hesitancy that many people may feel is the scale and the scope of the problem. It just feels like a, too big of an issue. And, and what can happen in that case psychologically is that we can shut down because the emotions are overwhelming. And I think that what's been really helpful for me um, as an activist and an advocate is to think about the local space. We may not be able to change national policy as just one person, but maybe we can speak out at a city council meeting about a measure that's going to impact environmental justice here in Charlottesville or surrounding counties. Maybe we can find out about something that's going on in a neighboring county and lend our voice to that effort. And so I think becoming locally involved and, and figuring out what's going on here in our areas is the first step. Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action is a great place to start. So for those of you who are not on our listserv, I would recommend signing up. There are a lot of really great resources as well as information about some of the efforts that VCCA and our partners are working on. And right now we're in the middle of a legislative session here in Virginia. So becoming educated about what bills are being considered how they will make an environmental impact, and then maybe just picking one. Just pick one bill, educate yourself, call your representatives, call your senators, voice your opinion. If you feel comfortable, say something about it on social media. Tell a friend or tell a neighbor who may not know about that bill. So I think starting small and then allowing that to snowball to the extent that you're comfortable is really kind of the way in for a lot of folks. And I think also um, it's amplifying the voices of the persons in those communities that you know are targeted. Oftentimes, you know, yes, we can go to city council and we can we can definitely speak our mind to say this should not happen within our communities. But reaching out, if you know that's happening around uh, along the lines of Hampton Roads, or if you know that you know Dominion is trying to to frack in Union Hill, or that national gas or natural gas, I think that was in what Chickahominy. Um, if you know that's happening in those areas, and even though it doesn't directly impact you, it does directly impact you eventually, right? So how do we lend voice and not necessarily speak for them? Because people back home in my community, we can speak for ourselves, we're just not giving a microphone. So how are you engaging and in, in bringing the power and the privilege that we have to be on this panel um, to say, let me not necessarily be at the table but bring someone who is from that community because we know the solutions um, because we have to live with the problem. Can I just say, I think that's such a great point, Ebony, and it can't be emphasized enough. And I think that also goes to the, the part about coalition building, which is that none of us can do this in isolation. And there may be opportunities 
to partner, even if you're not from a community that is going to first be impacted by an injustice, there may be opportunities to partner and to figure out the intersection of your skill set or the people that you know and how that can amplify the efforts of an existing community structure or activist um, network. I just want to remind people remotely and in the audience as well, if you want to have anything, please put it in the Q&A if you have a question or a comment. And um, for those in the audience, hold your questions and we'll have a time for a Q&A after that. So uh, that was a really great um, discussion of how to get involved and some examples um, locally. I wondered what keeps you guys motivated in the work that you do, because while there is hesitancy to get involved, sometimes it really can feel distressing, just the scale that you mentioned, Dr. Matia. Mm -hmm. I think what keeps me motivated is that there's really no other option. I mean, we are running out of time to keep global warming to below 1.5 degrees Celsius. And we know that there's, there's a spectrum here. It's not that either we stop climate change or we don't, it's how bad is it going to be? And we all continue, and as long as we're all alive, we will continue to have the power to, to slow that process and to keep the amount of warming below thresholds at which irreversible processes will be set off in terms of our weather patterns and extreme events. So I think what motivates me, keeps me motivated is the fact that there's always more work to be done. There is never a point at which we can throw up our hands and say we failed or we're, it's over and you know the fossil fuel industry has won. But on a more personal level, it's my patients, it's my toddler daughter, it's the other young people in my life who are going to have to live with these impacts much longer than I will. And, you know, like Dr. Hilton, I get very fired up about injustice and it's seeing the injustice that happens every day um, that kind of keeps me motivated. But I think taking care of yourself and checking in with your own emotions is extremely important as you alluded to Lena. And so for me, it's kind of limiting social media, taking breaks from consuming news and focusing locally as much as I can. And then when I have the emotional bandwidth to scale up those efforts. Yeah, and I think it goes back to um, what I was saying. There's there's people who are advocates because they're concerned and there's people who are advocates because of circumstance. And I can't afford to not be an advocate because my family still lives back there, right? Um, and so it, it is really one of those things of even when I feel like I get tired, I think about again, the children's of Hampton Road who can't afford to be tired. They're going to still get that lead poisoning regardless if they're tired or not. And so um, and so when you when you start to change the perspective of centering yourself, you find that you do get a lot of energy because um, and oftentimes, too, um, like when we're talking about the coalition um, building, it is leaning on other persons and their specific skill. I think the reason why it feels overwhelming for the most part is that oftentimes we try to step into a position that is not our strong point. If it's not your strong point to sing, then play the tambourines, right? <laughs> so, so when you're thinking about any type of injustice, um, environmental um, injustice, you can think about policy, you can think about um, the, the again, the, the way that communities are defined, the industrialization of different areas, you can find a, a spot that fits within your passion. Don't get outside of that, that lane. That's the lane that you were created to be inside of. So instead of saying, I have to do all of this, let me focus here and find someone else that can fit this little puzzle piece. And it's when you get that framework together, we know that that inter, interlocking is what actually builds strength, right? So, um, so I think that's the most important thing is going to gatherings like this of like-minded people who are, actively trying to learn about what we can do and then to say well let me take your piece and my piece and see how we can build on this thing that's such a great point and to give a concrete example i just want to shout out once again the pine grove project because i think this is such a cool story of coalition building and how people who are from a community that's most impacted can join in with people who are not necessarily most impacted and put our efforts together and that the Pine Grove project is led by people who still live in Pine Grove and or are descendants of that historically black community. And they have created this uh, nonprofit essentially to keep track of their history and to promote what's happening in Pine Grove, but also to serve as an advocacy organization to protect against threats like the Green Ridge landfill that's proposed. And I got involved with the Pine Grove project actually because my partner is what is a public historian and he, was asked to help out with efforts to save the Pine Grove School. 
And so when I spoke to Muriel Branch, who runs the Pine Grove Project and is a descendant herself, she talked to me about really the inextricability of environmental justice and historic and cultural justice, and that the devaluing of historic and cultural places, particularly those places that are associated with certain groups of people, um, is very much tied to environmental injustice. So when I spoke to her and I thought about, well, what, what can I do? What is my skill set? I can write and I know about children's health. So I wrote an op-ed about the pediatric health impacts of this. But part of this effort are now not only descendants and descendant community members, but also historians. We have architectural historians. We have people from the law school who have gotten involved from a legal standpoint. So we have an anthropologist who's involved. So it's really a, become a multidisciplinary uh, coalition building effort. And really Muriel Branch has been kind of at the center of this, uh, leading this effort as an descendant herself. And I think everyone has kind of figured out, okay, what, what can I contribute to this um, without overstepping and without taking on too much because we all have a role to play. And so I think things, efforts like that are really just great examples of how we can build coalitions that are multidisciplinary and that include um, and center the people who are most affected from those communities, as well as bring in other folks who wish to be involved. And just say one more thing, just to highlight it again, um, that if you do not have a person at the table who is a member, living community member of the most vulnerable population, then your table is incomplete. And, um, and that person shouldn't even just um, be at the table, they should be the leading voice of every discussion. And you listen first, to see what is the truth, because we can read about it, but until you actually live the experience um, of having to go and, and pick up bottled water because you're living in Flint, Michigan, and you can't drink out of this pipe, um, then you don't truly know it. I don't really know it, right? I can assume what that feels like, but, um, but I think, and that takes us getting outside of our own communities and getting relationships. Dr. Luna is here, and I know I was going to call on you, but, um, but you know, he's, a fantastic uh, representation of what it means to become family with the community and not a practitioner working with the community, right? There's a difference with that um, because you do need to build that trust because the most vulnerable communities are used to people constantly coming in, constantly asking questions. And then you go home to your gated community and you leave us here and nothing has changed for generations. And so how do you get to break through and earn that trust because it should be earned. Um, but then the way that you get them, get people to trust you is that you give them the, the luxury of voice that's been denied for generations. Thank you so much. Those are really wonderful answers. Um, now kind of refocusing, you mentioned, you know, we're all healthcare providers for this is medical center hours. So can you talk about how you work as individuals within the system, the healthcare system in this work and, and challenges or triumphs around that? I think for me, primarily, it's working through VCCA, Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action, and thinking about how across disciplines in the healthcare system and across fields and specialties, we can unite our, our collective experience and our efforts to speak out um, whether it be through op-eds, through the news media, or through advocacy during um, legislative efforts, as well as through more local coalition building, as I mentioned. And so that's kind of the main thing for me. Um, I think on a day-to-day -day basis, as far as the clinical work, it's really about making sure that our patients have awareness about these issues and how they are going to impact health. Like the fact that we're seeing more vector-borne illness for longer parts of the year because ticks and mosquitoes are out for much longer than they used to be. And so um, kind of bringing that knowledge and that awareness um, so that people understand and can make the connections as well. Yeah, and, um, I have a consultant firm, Good Stock Consulting, and we are pretty much agnostic to industry, but we try to address disparities across the board, um, knowing that they all funnel into a bigger picture, right? Um, and so one of the ways that we have gotten involved, particularly within this pandemic, is to see what is the intersection of environmental injustice and health, again, when we're talking about this pandemic, um, if we're looking at the social determinants of health and understanding where you, you live, sleep, play, and pray, that is a huge risk factor or, or one of the contributors to your overall health. And, and with this pandemic, we started to say, hey, let's talk to the Virginia Department of Health. Um, I've 
some kind of way talked myself um, onto a committee that was working with um, the CDC and the White House um, task force to talk about the, the fact that we're saying children can go back to school in a blanket statement, not, not in one breath mentioning the fact that in 2019, the Office of Government Accountability said that at least 40% of the public school systems needed 50% of their HVAC systems replaced, right? That's their environment. You know, it's not just the trees. It's, it's where these children are spending eight to 10 hours a day um, in a classroom in the middle of a pandemic. And is that why black and brown children are more likely to be hospitalized and or die? Is that why even before the pandemic, black and brown children are, are more likely to be hospitalized and or die from asthma? Same thing. Um, if we can't talk about the the coronavirus and the um, the risk of severe disease without talking about comorbidities, and you can't talk about that without talking about the influence of air and water pollution. Um, and so it, it really is, it's not a separate thing. It all does coalesce into one big problem. So where I like to focus is really on policy um, because it's easy to do a stroke of a pen and the persons that are usually in political power in that seat come from a very privileged um, background because it's hard to take off work um, where you get evicted if you don't go to work and we got to go to, to the Capitol for days at a time that doesn't really fly if you're poor, right? So um, who gets those positions, but people who are not in those communities in the first place. So really giving a, a um, different viewpoint to say, how are, we, how are we with our policies, making sure that we're not just stating equity in theory and um, centering the, the privileged, but are we actually changing the process by which we think um, and, and lending an ear to the vulnerable populations? Thank you. I want to pivot a little bit to um, talk about the responsibility of the healthcare system at large. Um, at the COP26 conference in Glasgow, the U.S. committed to decarbonizing the healthcare sector and develop the HHS Health Sector Climate Pledge, which a lot of different institutions um, participated in, Children's Hospital in D.C., Kaiser Permanente, Healthcare Without Harm, a lot of different institutions. The pledge is closed right now, but it may open up again. There was another initiative um, in Maine called the Blue Wrap Project. I think it's kind of fun. I think that UVA had a similar project. It was intended to provide a forum for recognizing operating room waste. And so the program recycled the blue wraps that are used to autoclave instruments. And they had these local models and activists walk a runway in gowns and dresses and headwear using the blue wrap. And they raised about $250,000 for world health programs. So I guess the question really is, can an entire healthcare system really make some changes? And is there a reasonable argument that such action just jeopardizes quality over sustainability? I think we can make those changes. I think it will require a lot of humility because I think there are a lot of countries in the world that are much lower waste than we are when it comes to the healthcare sector, as you alluded to, Dr. Kelly. And um, you know, I think that quality is not necessarily tied to how much waste one generates. So I think if we have the humility as a system, as a sector to learn from what folks are doing in other countries and, and still maintaining a very high level of quality, I think we could we could move the needle. And I think it's an important and, and worthwhile uh, conversation to have because the healthcare sector does contribute significantly to um, fossil fuel emissions and um, we need to be evaluating all, all sectors and figuring out where we, as in whatever industry one belongs to, where we can make a difference. Yeah, and when you think about just how much, if the healthcare industry was its own country, we would be the fifth largest emitter of, of carbon. So yes, it's not a should we do it, it's we must do it. For one, if we think about how we are therefore um, contributing to the health diseases that we are trying to treat, right? It's like, which one comes first, the chicken or the egg? And then, you know, especially within the United States of America, we do produce a lot of waste on all fronts. Um, but that being said, I have done mission um, trips in, in countries that are a little less financially um, stable, and yet their outcomes were just as good, if not better than ours. And the question is, is because this blueprint of waste and pollution of the air and water um, that we are, are allowing due to our hospital waste in the United States of America, is that contributing to our lung disease? Is it contributing to the fact that we're getting cancers at higher rates? Um, 
is is are we are we the problem? Um, and so that's something I think we need to to deal with and really put a a microscope on ourselves because oftentimes we always sort of say what they should do, but it's what should we do? Um, because I mean, if we look at what we just did today, we got a lot of plastic floating around in here. Um, and do, yes, we do have to eat, um, but we've become accustomed to this as as far as Americans, right? We we get used to going to the cafeteria and, and picking up that that fork and taking it to our office to eat that salad. And the salad is fantastic for our bodies, and that fork is horrible for our land. So, yeah. Okay. So. Um, now, I think we're going to get some audience member involvement underway. Dr. Mathieu, would, can you kind of walk us through this interest and skill mapping exercise, please? Sure. This exercise comes from uh, Dr. Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson, who is an incredible biologist and climate activist and scientist. She co-edited this book, All We Can Save, which I highly recommend. It's a book of essays uh, for solutions for the climate crisis with a very much a feminist and womanist perspective. And she has this incredible uh, exercise that I think is really helpful for those who feel a little bit uh, lost, like they're not sure where to begin. And so I think we're passing around some, some of these worksheets, which hopefully the folks online can see. If not, you can Google Ayana Elizabeth Johnson, find your climate superpower to see an example. But it's this three-way Venn diagram. And the first circle at the top says, what brings you joy? The second circle says, what are you good at? And then what needs doing? And then the intersection of those three is where Dr. Johnson says you should start thinking about focusing your efforts and your energies to get involved. So I'll just kind of walk through my own thought process with this as an example. So what brings me joy? I love to write. Um, I love the written word creatively and in terms of advocacy work. What needs doing? I think we need more people to be aware of the scale of how the climate crisis is going to affect our health, uh, particularly our most vulnerable and particularly our children. And what am I good at? Well, my expertise as a general pediatrician is understanding children's health and how the environment affects children's health. So the center of those for me might be writing op-eds about environmental justice issues and how they impact children's health or speaking on news media about the children's health impact of various uh, bills that are being proposed that may affect the environment. So. If you wanna just take a few minutes to think about this, you can either write on the worksheet or write on a separate piece of paper, um, but hopefully this will generate some food for thought as you begin to contemplate how to get involved if you are not already involved. And if you're in the audience, we encourage you to maybe turn to your neighbor and have a little discussion with them too about this so you can generate some conversation. If you're watching from somewhere else, if you have somebody else in the room that you can talk to about this, it's it can be helpful to have this as a discussion as well. So I think we'll give all of y'all about two minutes to think about this and discuss with your audience members. And then we're gonna open it up to the audience Q&A. All righty. So I think we're going to uh, go ahead and transition to Q&A. And so we have, for those who are joining us remotely, you can type into the Q&A via Zoom and we'll be monitoring that. But then if there's anyone with in the live audience who has questions, please feel free to raise your hand. I can begin by um, just looking at the chat, uh, Marsha Day Childress. Uh, I, I hope that um, we did address this somewhat, but I'll read what she wrote. From all you've said, we can see how important it is for healthcare professionals to work for environmental justice. Your individual commitments and actions are important and admirable. To what extent are we likely to see our institution, UVA Health and UVA itself, engage formally in similar advocacy work and invest in environmental justice? To really enact major changes, it seems we need big institutions to, to, to join individuals and put their money into this effort. Absolutely. <laughs> here, here. 
Agreed, Dr. Childress. <laughs> I can ask one here. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being part of this event. Um, so I helped put this together. So I have a selfish um, first question to kick us off from the audience. Um, I was wondering if you'd be interested in talking a little bit more, um, really any of you, about um, UVA's efforts to train future practitioners to be more aware of these things. Like what's the role of curriculum and research opportunities that the university provides to young future doctors and nurses and others in healthcare? So I would just mention the Nurses Climate Action uh, Challenge by Annie that I discussed a little bit earlier. And it really is a commitment for schools of nursing to engage more in curriculum content around the issue of health impacts of climate change. So um, really the pledge is, is a very little lift. It, it's that we put it into the curriculum and uh, monitor that. Um, from the medical school perspective, um, we as students have been working really hard to get uh, planetary health and, and environmental justice and environmental racism, all these topics kind of covered more in our curriculum. So um, some progress that we've made includes a fourth year elective that now I actually get, I help design, I get to take next week. So that's exciting. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, um, and then some in sort of the preclinical uh, years, which is the first and second year roughly, um, we learn about organ systems. And so this, my student, this group that I'm a part of has been really um, sort of hounding the teaching faculty every year with examples of how, you know, he impairs kidney function or how air quality has pulmonary uh, health effects, those kinds of things. And so in sort of providing these examples, we have in, in some areas been successful in getting them incorporated into pre-existing lectures that are in place, um, but in, we still have a lot more work to do. One really cool measure of, of, of our progress or lack thereof has been um, this annual evaluation that we run that's called the Planetary Health Report Card. This is something that was designed by medical students out in San Francisco and uh, this was, I mean, only three or four years ago, and then expanded each year to include schools of medicine and now schools of nursing as well across the country and then world. Um, we're in our third year this year, and I think we're going to publish that in uh, April on Earth Day. So that is this kind of longitudinal assessment of um, research opportunities, uh, mentorship opportunities, funding opportunities, uh, educational coverage, um, trying to think what else, like community engagement, all sort of this multifaceted assessment to see where we are, what we've changed and what we need to do better. Um, in running those evaluations every year, not only do we know, have a better sense of what needs to happen, but we also, like I said, have like regular opportunities, to just check in with people and bother them. <laughs> Cause like the whole squeaky wheel thing. Um, yeah. One other thing I wanted to mention is the School of Nursing continuing that is putting on a conference April 22nd. Shout out to Linda Hansen who has done a lot of work with that. So we invite everybody to participate in that um, conference as well. Hello. Um, hello, hi, uh, my name is Troy. I, um, I work for a company called Mizetti. Uh, we do healthcare uh, sustainability and engineering work. Uh, and then I'm also, uh, at least for the next week, I interim pastor at a local church. Uh, so I have a comment and then a question. So the comment is um, that Don Berwick, who is the, uh, in some senses, the founder of healthcare quality uh, in the U.S., is um, I have the opportunity to work with him um, as part of some work we did for the National Academy of Medicine. Um, and he will say explicitly today. Um, that if he were creating his quality criteria again, uh, he would include carbon. Uh, and he think it was something that, that he, he missed. Uh, and I'm saying that just to say that um, for, the, for the founders of the quality movement in the US, um, they think that carbon sustainability is an integral part of what healthcare, what, of what healthcare does. Uh, and then my question is, uh, is a general one. Uh, I'm just curious about how uh, UVA Medical Center is thinking about sustainability, uh, equity, and environmental health, uh, specifically in Charlottesville, and let's say the mile to mile and a half radius around uh, around the hospital, to the extent that you know. I don't know of any. Um, and 
and I, I mean, I, I, that's just honest. I don't know of any, but I do, I will um, kind of echo what you were saying. I would assume UVA is the largest employer of our city. Um, I would assume that it probably generates most traffic um, with patients driving in and workers driving in every morning. Um, and so therefore we probably contribute to the most waste in our city. And so is there an honest on UVA to think about equity? And especially when you look at what, what communities of persons um, live around the hospital. And we know that the hospitals are usually centered in lower income communities, right? And we, we know what's on the outskirt. They are col getting collateral damage from the, the waste that we produce, right? So how do you give back to that community? Um, and it really does lead you to think there are simple ways that you can, simple ways, there are things that we can do to help improve that. If it's planting of trees within those communities, if it's establishing UVA community gardens, that we are responsible for planting these gardens and allowing for fresh um, food to be available to the community. You know, how do we, how do we engage and again, go to the communities and ask them, what do you need from us? And what do you need for us to stop, stop doing, <laughs> stop driving through their communities so their children can actually play, um, right? That could be one thing. But, um, but yeah, but it's, it's I, I do think that with as much power as we have at the University of Virginia, and I do say we, because I'm a, I'm a part of this problem too, but um, that we do have a greater responsibility to correct what we've done. Thank you. So um, I, I know that there's like a sustainability um, committee in the hospital. And to be honest, I'm not actually sure what all the efforts are ongoing right now, specifically for the hospital. There are, however, like university-wide sustainability um, goals. I believe there's like carbon neutrality by 2030 and, and um, you know, plastic free by, I'm looking at Dana because I don't remember all the specific details, but, um, you know, that's sort of university across the whole university. Those are some sort of sustainability goals that are underway. I wish I could give concrete examples of ways that the hospital is addressing environmental racism specifically, but I think Dr. Hilton kind of suggested some potential areas of improvement. Um, I'm not aware of any right now. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Isabella. I'm a social worker here. Um, this is more of like a comment that I thought of during that past dis discussion. Um, just thinking about food and agriculture as something that the hospital could participate in. Um, Cause I was thinking about waste and there's some medical things that like we can't reduce our waste in. I'm thinking all the gowns and gloves and stuff like that. Um, but because we are such a large employer um, and when we think of the food system um, and how we could be more sustainable in that effort. Um, and I know you guys don't know like a ton about what UVA is doing specifically. Um, I'm just thinking that's like an interesting path that we could take and make some action on. One of, one of the other things mentioned by Daniel in the, um, in the uh, question and answer is can tell mouth telehealth be expanded without the excuse now of COVID. Um, it seems like a movable obstacle. So that may help in many ways. I want to address that. Yes, I think that's a great point. And, and we have seen um, in telehealth, in fact, I, I think one of Dr. Hilton's colleagues in anesthesiology has um, done some, he, he gave a grand rounds a few weeks ago and talked about how now we have been able to measure the climate impact of the increase in telehealth during the pandemic and how that actually has decreased um, the waste sort of indirectly generated by the healthcare system as far as people driving in and transportation use. And we know that in pediatrics, actually, there have been situations where telehealth is actually now preferable. So for instance, we do a lot of check-ins for children who are on medications for ADHD. And not every one of those check-ins needs to be in person. And so we have certain situations like that where actually it may be preferable for the family as well to not come in every three months for something that really could be done, at least in some cases, via telehealth. So I think there are definitely some opportunities to utilize the lessons learned in telehealth and carry them forward as appropriate. I really like Dr. Mathieu's discussion of kind of um, the benefits of convenience about telehealth in addition to sustainability. There are also like some 
scenarios where clinically it makes a lot more sense. For example, kids with ADHD, sometimes if they're in their own environment, you can actually get a better sense of, you know, their normal behavior versus when they're really nervous sitting in a doctor's office, it's an unfamiliar environment. So um, there are a lot of benefits to telehealth that obviously we should continue capitalizing on. And we would be amiss if we didn't make the statement though, that we know there's Wi-Fi deserts that exist within the black and brown communities and the lower income communities. So um, we always have to think, especially University of Virginia, again, if we're thinking of where to put our money and if we're trying to look at the intersection, this little Venn diagram, right? If we're saying that um, telehealth is a great thing for the hospital system and it will do a great thing for the community, then we gotta think about the individual as this top, um, um, Venn diagram circle and what's the intersection of these and what's missing and Wi-Fi will be what's missing for that individual. And so if you're thinking of ways that UVA can plant a garden, which I'm a fan of that, although I can't keep plants alive, but, um, but we can plant gardens. We can, we can create a system in which um, we put Wi-Fi. Um, what do they call it? Somebody? Hotspots. That would go hotspots um, within communities and or thinking like I was talking to Dr. Luna and Dr. Matea um, before the session started and thinking about the pediatric population and telehealth. Why do we not plan a clinic within the elementary schools and have telehealth um, capabilities so that the school nurse can, can, you know, telehealth into the pediatrician to have on-site care. So for one, that mom and dad don't have to get off work to come to school to take a sick child home and the care can already start happening there. And then you can also use, if that clinic is within the elementary school, then at five to 7 p.m., you can have a student run medicine clinic, a student run um, dental clinic, where parents can come into that same spot and receive healthcare. And it's a total family approach, meeting the family where they actually are, instead of having this traffic back and forth, especially the people that may have difficulty getting traffic back and forth, so. As a single parent of a sick child, I would have loved that 10, 15 years ago. Um, partnerships are really important, and I want to address something that Taylor just asked. A gentleman that spoke a little bit earlier, uh, they would like to know, again, the name of your company and your name. So maybe there's something going on that they'd like to um, <laughs> touch with you. Yeah, so my company is Mazzetti, uh, M-A-Z-Z-E-T-T-I, and my name is Troy Savage. Thank you. Um, and if I can come and give you my information. If somebody wants to get in contact with me directly, I can do that. Oh, sorry. Uh, M-A-Z-Z-E-T-T-I. And my name is Troy, T-R-O-Y. Another question from the Q&A from Sean Selby is what can we do as clinicians to make the most impactful change with our patients in the clinical setting and outside of the hospital? I think it depends on one's specialty. I mean, we all see different patient populations with different types of pathologies and issues and we also still need to come back to that Venn diagram. So we may all be clinicians, but we don't all have the same skill sets or interests or come from the same communities and backgrounds. So I think it's about sort of taking stock of, of what's going on with your patient population or with your health system and kind of figuring out how to, how to move the needle in your setting. I know there have been efforts um, in anesthesiology to change the gases that you all use. And so that's one small example. You could probably talk about more eloquently than I could, Dr. Hilton, but you know that's a very specialty specific example of moving the needle on something that's, that's commonly done in, in the anesthesia world. Right, and, and Dr. Uh, Matt Meyer, who's not here, but is a fantastic advocate. He's an anesthesiologist that works a lot with um, climate control and, and climate action, I think. And one of the things he talks about is the anesthetic gases and the release of nitric oxide for it, or, um, nitrous oxide for, um, into the environment and what impact it has on our environment. I think when, and when thinking about patients, I try to uh, just get to know the patient's just life story. Um, and there are certain things that we, we can't change acutely, um, but if you notice that a person is coming in, especially if you're, I work in the ICU, so sometimes, um, unfortunately, we get to really know a family because they're there for quite some time, and you can get a sense of 
you know, what is the ventilation in, in their house? And, and is there a way that we can get them resources? Maybe it's that you just help that one family with getting, um, you know, a, a filter system within their house. Um, I oftentimes, you know, direct them to this website called AuntBertha.com that helps with different resources that are free and or financially reduced um, to help assist. But I think the, the best thing you can do to advocate for your patients is really to get involved politically. And I know that's not everyone's wheelhouse, but to, to, um, to really make an impact on the community level, we have to start looking at how's the allocation of funds and resources coming from the federal to state level, right? Because we know that once the federal dollars are released, the state really has control over how this thing is allocated. And unfortunately, those communities are still hit um, time and time again. So becoming involved politically um, and whether that is you being actively involved or coming a part of the larger coalition that you don't have to be the voice of, but you can lend your, your political voice to it um, would be great. Um, but I think just the, the idea of an acute change on the environmental level is difficult in the patient to patient interaction, but that does not mean that you can't make some impactful change. Um, and I'll, I'll just give an example of something that's really, really small, but in the time of COVID is important. But one of our, our patients for an outpatient clinic came in with a cloth mask and just sitting down and talking to them about, well, let's talk about the difference in the cloth mask versus the surgical mask. And, and let me give you a few to protect yourself. Um, you know, because people do what they think is best because they don't, they don't know yet, right? Um, and so I think just having those conversations, but again, my approach to environmental justice is more politically leaning. And I just want to say, I think I heard you say something really important, Dr. Hilton, which is that, you know, may, maybe everyone isn't comfortable being politically engaged and politically active, but I would submit as we're kind of coming to a close here that if you don't feel uncomfortable, then you're perpetuating the status quo most likely. And all of us are going to have to get outside of our comfort zones in some way, even if all of us aren't going to be showing up, you know, on advocacy lobby days. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my, my microphone went out for a second. Um, all of us are going to have to do something that's outside of our comfort zones at some point. I know we're like ending right now, but one very small thing that I do as a medical student in the clinical setting is every time I see a patient, I, if I have enough time, I try to actually Google map where they're coming from. You know, if we get a sense of where they're actually where they are from versus just like assuming they're from Charlottesville, or even if they are from Charlottesville, seeing where within Charlottesville they are, then you already can kind of start building a picture of more of those environmental factors that might be impacting their health. That's a fantastic point um, that you may, you know, I mean, it goes back to the um, camps in the road, children with the, you know, blood, or lead poisoning. If you know where someone lives and, and UVA, we're going back to the question of what is UVA doing? We already have geo mapped every disease process you can imagine, especially within our region. So we don't have to, to stretch our minds to think what resources does that community actually need? So if it's, if it's not a, um, a matter of being ignorant of the situation, then it's apathy. And, and, I, and I take that as a personal um, charge too. If, if I know something is happening and I'm not doing anything to address it offensive, then I must be okay with it. And so when I ask us all as individuals and as a community and as a healthcare system, is, are we okay with it? Um, and if the answer is no, then we need to do something. Folks, I'm sorry, I am that person that is the timekeeper and we've reached our time, but I think that we ended on a really amazing note and I hope that you've built some connections with each other to kickstart and, and uh, get out of um, that apathy that sometimes we find ourselves in and um, I hope that you take the opportunity to connect with one another and to do this work in a way that is meaningful for you and makes sense for all of you and just my, my deepest and sincerest thanks to all of you um, on our panel. Thank you. Thank you.